When did music first start uh, coming into your life? Was it something that was there right from the very start? <coughs> well, yes. I've been exposed to music ever since I can remember. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Nice natural cough makes things sort of relaxed there, down to earth. <laughs> uh, music has been uh, my life. I, I was exposed to music. As a matter of fact, the first song, it's very funny, the very first really song I was, was exposed to was Rhapsody in Blue, which I, there's no better way to come into this world than through Rhapsody in Blue than to hear uh, a song like that being played. And... Uh, what is there about, what is the, you have like an early recollection of hearing Rhapsody in Blue? Oh or? yeah, when I hear Rhapsody in Blue, I'm certain every time I hear it that I'm going back to age two. From, from age, well actually two, when I was two weeks old, they used to play Rhapsody in Blue at my grandmother's house where my mother used to go visit a lot. And uh, so the Rhapsody in Blue has become kind of one of the songs of my life. It sort of became a general life theme. And uh, yeah, music has been uh, my life. I've been exposed to it. My father was a songwriter. Before I was born, he was writing songs. And uh, right around the time I was born, he would sing to me. My mother would play the organ and my dad would sing. And they do duets, organ and piano. And so as far back as I can remember, there's been music in my life. Did your father ever try to get the Beach Boys to record one of his tunes? Oh, sure. He, he wrote Breakaway with me. He, he, was, he was the uh, ghostwriter on Breakaway. He, his name was Reggie Dunbar on that song. So he uh, ghost wrote, wrote uh, Breakaway. And yes, he's tried a number of times to have us do different songs. Not that, not that many times, but uh, yeah, sure. Now, your brothers as well, right from the start, as young as you were, were involved in music, or did that come later to them? to uh, Carl and Dennis? Well, they, it came a little later to them. See, they're a little younger than I am, but uh, relatively speaking, it, it, they re we really all started around the same time. I think as far as really getting into it, my brother Carl was into rock and roll before I was. He's uh, four years younger, and yet he was listening to uh, rock and roll radio before I was. I was into the four freshmen and uh, into jazz and things the like that. The high lows? Yeah, the high lows and the freshmen. And I was sort of uh, patterning, pat patterning my life around... Uh, or my music around the freshman style. And Carl was into Chuck Berry and uh, Little Richard and things like that before I was. So uh, in a sense, he got just as much education as I did. He's had as many years education in that field. How is it like, um, not musically I'm talking about, but just like growing up with uh, Dennis and Carl, what kind of rapport was there or friendship well, amongst there, the three there, brothers there, as kids I'm talking there about? There was now. a musical rapport. As kids, we fought as much as any kids fought, we had, uh, Dennis and I didn't get along that well. We always had a little bit of a, an uh, uneasy relationship. He, uh, for some reason, he and I had astrological conflict or whatever you want to call it, however people would define what, it. What's the, what are the signs there? Well, there's Sagittarius and Gemini, but I, I would think that uh, uh, there was an astrological uh, rift going on for a while. But then as the Beach Boys gathered together, we seem to have gotten along as human beings a lot better. And, uh, but no, there was a rapport musically between the three of us. We used to sing in our bedroom, come down, come down from your ivory tower, let love come into your heart. We used to sing that, and, <laughs> and it was sort of a, uh, an omen, or whatever you want to call it, to the, uh, it, it, it sort of uh, cut out a future for us, because in future years, we harmonized in a very similar way, a three-part harmony. The three of you share a bedroom? Yes, we shared a bedroom. Can you remember the first time you might have started uh, fantasizing or talking about forming a group? <coughs> no, we never it fantasized about that, no. I mean, that that no developed <coughs> very quickly. That developed over a period of weeks and, and when I was about 19 years old. Dennis was 17, Carl was 15. And uh, we, we kind of developed into a group sort of through the wishes of Dennis. He said that uh, at school, he told me that the kids at school knew I was musical because I'd done some, sh some uh, singing for, for uh, assemblies and so on. And he said, why don't you write a song about surfing? Because surfing was becoming a big fad. So it so happened that we got together and uh, Mike Love came up with bomb, bomb, dip, 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 you know, that Jan and Dean mm -hmm. type riff. Mm -hmm. And I came up with some, uh, some of the background music and we just uh, flowed right into a career from out of nowhere. It was just, just an amazing start. And he said, why don't you write a song about surfing? Because surfing was becoming a big fad. So it so happened that we got together and uh, Mike Love came up with bomb, bomp, dip, 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 you know, that Jan and Dean type riff. Mm -hmm. And I came up with some, uh, some of the background music and we just uh, flowed right into a career from out of nowhere. It was just, just an amazing start. It must have been an incredible thing for it just to come crashing down like that, like from, like you said, a matter of weeks from being uh, 
uh, just high, a college student, high school students, and so on. And then being a rock and roll star. Right, to becoming overnight success, overnight wealth. That's the thing that hit me the hardest was the fact that uh, I wasn't thinking, oh my God, I don't just think I don't have to get up and go to work to make my money. The money's rolling in from sales of records. I was just really set. I mean, it gave me a lot of confidence. You know what I mean? It can it can do tricks on your head. Did you quit school? You were in oh, college, yeah, I right? Quit, I quit college as soon as I saw that surfing was making, and I saw no reason to continue there. I thought I'd funnel my time into uh, my career. Now, the first record was, I, I know this because I recently looked in a book where they listed um, rare records, rare singles, and what they're, what they're worth. Now, you did a record under the name Kenny and the Cadets, right? Right. Now, according to this, I forget the name of the book. I think Art LeBeau puts it out or something. That single is worth, to collectors, more money than, than any, any other record, any other rock and roll record in history, singles. There's like, must be very, very few copies of it around. Right. The record by Kenny and the Cadets. What's the story in that record? Well, the story, there's hardly a, there's hardly a story to it, except that uh, the story is that uh, it uh, was uh, a song that I didn't write, so therefore I didn't pattern it for myself. I just merely sang it, and... Uh, uh, Were the other Beach Boys on it, or just you? Just my mother and I, and Carl. <laughs> Kenny, we're Kenny and the Cadets, and right. uh, I was Kenny, <laughs> and uh, the Cadets was my mother and Carl. We, we didn't, I didn't particularly like the record. Uh, I thought the record was weak. I thought that it needed more background and that the vocals weren't strong. But that's simple story. That's all there is to that story, really. Well, do you have a copy of the record? No, I don't, personally. Do you know who does? I mean, it's like no, a, people I, are offering literally thousands and thousands of dollars, collectors are, for this record. Yeah, I, I, I was offered... Uh, uh, I was offered uh, a copy by a fan once, and I, I think I turned him down. I said, no, I'd rather not hear the record. <laughs> when was the last time you heard it? Oh, geez, years <laughs> ago. I mean, that had to have been uh, at least 15, 20 years ago, something around 18 years ago. Now, was that kind of a, a regional hit in, in California? No, or, no, no, it was a totally obscure record. Obscure. Yeah. What was it called? Barbie. Do you remember it? Who wrote it? I mean, what's this? Barbie, his... Barbie. <laughs> That's about all I can remember. <laughs> That and was the first record. Yeah, the other side was, <coughs> what is a young girl made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, the simple little commercial songs, you know? Yeah. That's the Frankie Avalon kind of song was happening that those days. You know, in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, your Frankie Venus. Avalon. Venus. Oh, Frankie Avalon is, is, is uh, speaking of old artists, is, is je definitely one of my very favorite artists of all time. He, uh, he just had such a voice. There was something about the man that, that you, it's a quality. You know that quality? You'll have a special artist and you'll say, oh, I just revere artists like that. Anyway, he's one of my revered artists. I think he's tops. I think he's wonderful. Frank Sinatra is also another artist. I, I wrote a song for Frank Sinatra. Uh, funny thing. I wrote a song about th two or three weeks ago for Frank, personally, called Still I Dream of It, and I'm presenting it to him this week. I doubt if he'll take it. I don't, it's the sort of thing. He's looking for the commercial song. I mean, he's almost 60 years old, and he, I mean, he doesn't want to be singing the same old, when somebody loves you, it's no good unless they love you all the way. You know, I mean, I'm sure he can appreciate good material no matter what it is. Mm. It's hard to say, depending on the frame of mind he's in, if he take my song. I might change it around for him if he wants. Anyway, I did that. That's, that was just for a feather in my cap. I also might approach Stevie Wonder and Elton John with the same song, if Sinatra decides not to do it. W would it be a song that you'd ever think of recording? Oh, yeah. If, if they don't do it, I'm going to do it for sure, without a doubt. Is there something in, in you that would like to do a, an album, let's say, of those kinds of, so kind of like a crooner kind of album? Yeah, something I, like I would love to do a crooner album. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm cut out for the crooner, crooner type music. I love singing ballads. I like... Uh, tort songs. Tort songs. I love them. I think they're... Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, that rec I recall an album called Only the Lonely that Frank mm. Sinatra made, which is, was, was superb. I mean, that's... That is class listening. You don't get better than that. I mean, it's also got one of the, that album has one of the album covers that remains in my right. mind more than almost oh. any other of the clown and the, the tears the coming down. The vibrations of that album were just, were, was definitely on a high level. And uh, it's, that, it's that kind of music that means the most in my life and that has lasted in my life. I'll take that off the shelf now and then and I'll play it. And uh, it'll, uh, it'll make me cry at times and I'll go through my thing. Getting back to what we were talking about, uh, uh, I plan to use most of my material for the Beach Boys. I think that uh, uh, the group is, should be central in my life, which it is, and I think that it should remain central uh, to me and to my material. I think that writing a song for Frank Sinatra should be considered a side venture for a feather in the cap, an honor to meet him if I get to meet him, and so on like that. But generally speaking, most of the stuff, 99% of my stuff is, is intended for the, for the group 
because this is where home is. Home is with the Beach Boys with me, you know. Right. It's, it's interesting to hear you talk this way because I feel the same way about music, especially a lot of the old uh, people like Dick Hames and, uh, and Sinatra and Nat King Cole and all, but there's a certain level of thought amongst rock and rollers, let's say, that no music uh, was written before about 1955. So it's really nice to hear you talking about your love of uh, some of this older music, oh, different style. Oh, adore it. I just, uh, I'd, uh, for anyone out there who's, who's in tune with Nelson Riddle, I, I think, uh, considering old Nels, his talent, uh, it, it can humble a person thinking of the, 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 the size of the musician we're speaking of here. Uh, we're not speaking of a small musician by any means. We're talking about a very big musician in this world. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he's definitely, music runs through his blood. He breathes music. You know, there are people that breathe music. And uh, one of those people is Nelson Riddle. One of those people are Frank Sinatra. Gordon Jenkins, the Gordon Jenkins great arranger for Sinatra. Music. I mean, you know, there's, there are certain people that just breathe it somehow. They just can't do wrong. They'll take a breath, and out comes the music. You Some know? people say that about you. Oh, I've been told that I like that, too. I, I feel that I breathe music myself. I, uh, I, I, I uh, live it. I don't know if I breathe it, but I know I live it. And uh, it's uh, definitely the most spiritual single thing that's ever happened in my life has been music, and uh, it remains to be, you know. So do you think, from, um, from the way you're talking, that people who love the Beach Boys might in years to come hear um, a whole lot of different kinds of music from the Beach Boys rather than the kind of sound we used to hearing? Yes, I think that one of the things the Beach Boys have always imparted was a message that versatility was our keynote. Uh, we're not used to anything but versatility. We got used to the fact that everything is different. From one moment to the next, you have a different mood, different texture, different... And this is how our albums move. Our albums have that same motion, just like life. It's like... Uh, one experience is much deeper than the next, one has a lot more uh, emotion than the next, or one might be a little more exciting than the next, you know? There's a lot of emotion, but there's a similar, th there's a flow. I mean, the fact that you can hear 12 cuts on an album, that's the flow in itself. It's all music. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it changes around and that it becomes interesting is uh, a keynote of the Beach Boys. Do you take a great deal of care in how the album is programmed? What track follows what track? Uh, yeah, we sit and vote on that. We, uh, we sit down and decide. We say, well, what do you think should start the album out? What should be the last cut? We sort of get our first and last cut first. What's the first cut? What's the last cut? Then we fill in the spaces, two, three, four, and five, you know. Okay. Let's get back to uh, the Beach Boys for We were talking about you and your brothers and all. Now, now, Mike Love got involved in what way? Well, he got involved uh, through uh, being a cousin, part of the family. It was... Uh, a family venture from the start, and it's remained a family venture, and uh, the brothers, the cousin, and the good friend, and... Uh, Al Jardine being yeah, a good friend. right, and we're a family, and uh, because of the fa fact that we used to sing Christmas carols together on Christmas at Mike Love's house, his mother used to teach us Christmas carols, and we'd harmonize. We're a family, and uh, because of the fa fact that we used to sing Christmas carols together on Christmas at Mike Love's house, his mother used to teach us Christmas carols, and we'd harmonize. And Michael and I would uh, go off into the other room and start singing, Happy, happy birthday, baby, doo-wah, doo-wah, you know. And we, he'd add a few little bass lines, and I used to recognize that he had a great bass voice. Well, I started teaching him uh, for freshman parts. I thought I'd capitalize on his bass voice and have him harmonize and uh, teach him songs, arrangements such similar to the modern harmonies of the four freshmen. Well, this is how we started out, by doing modern harmony. Then when Dennis uh, suggested the surf song, this is when, of course, the story begins to take shape and turns into the, for the formate, formates into the Beach Boy group as it is now. But would I love to hear the Beach Boys sing Polka Dots and Moonbeams? Oh, uh, if that isn't an amazing song. Uh, Michael... Now, John Denver j did the song, right? About, oh, about beautiful six lyric, months ago. Beautiful lyric. A country dance was being held in a garden. I felt a bump and heard an old beg your pardon. Yeah, it, 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 that's, as a matter of fact, that's one of my theme songs in my life mm. that has a strong meaning to my life. It, uh, I was going through a strong emotional period in college and I'd play that album and I'd cry and... Suddenly I turned and saw polka dots and moonbeams on a pug nose tree. tree. Dream. Dr dream, on a pug nose dream. Isn't that right. a beautiful concept? <laughs> it's, ju it's just certain th songs hang in your head, and, the, and they're little messages from God. And uh, so, yeah, I, I taught Mike these harmonies, and we'd, uh, we'd go through these little uh, trips of, hey, we're going to be another four freshmen. Hey, look out for us. Uh, we're really, we really harmonize here. Then we kind of went the other way, kind of went... Uh, into, uh, my stomach's growling here, we went into uh, uh, rock and roll music, which I incorporated some freshman harmony, like in Surfer Girl, and mm -hmm. we retained a certain amount of the influence of the freshmen in our uh, 
in our group sound and uh you can hear it a lot on the beach boys christmas album yes that, that was arranged as a matter of fact by the freshman uh arranger dick reynolds all oh, right see i didn't know that okay now who were um uh the pendletones pendletones were the beach boys before they were the beach boys any records under that title no and who were uh, uh carl and the passions carl and the passions were the beach boys before they were the Beach Boys. No, that well, yeah, that was a high school group, and then they used it for a title of an album. Yeah, that's when they when they brought back Pet Sounds and put it yeah. together with uh, Carl and the Passions. Carl and the so Passions tough. was myself, Carl, Mike, and a friend of mine at school. I want to talk to you about the making of the Beach Boy records. Right. Like, uh, just kind of briefly an outline how the thing happens. Do you write at home or do you write in the studio? And well, are, there, are the arrangements born when you're all together in the studio or no, do you hear it all in your head? It's conceived in my head before we go, we, before I ever approach the group. Uh, I've been, I have been utilizing the studio as my writing environment. Uh, it's a good environment. There's a circular stained glass window right behind the piano, which gives it a little spiritual effect in the studio, and I feel secure there. So I wrote the last two albums at the studio. Uh, pre previous to that, I did most of my writing at home, at my house. And uh, would uh, after I would get the arrangement conceived, I would then approach the group and say, hey, I got a new song, I want you to hear the arrangement. I want to teach you guys the parts. Well, then we'd continue to practice and we'd proceed to record that way. And then how much do the other Beach Boys say, hey, let's try, the, I mean, th there must be a, a, a cer certain evolution that happens in the studio and some changes that the yes, record goes there, through. Yes, there, there, there are changes. Most of the changes I'll make myself. Uh, the changes basically with the group are Michael will make a lyrical adjustment, uh, Carl will make an arrangement adjustment with a guitar or something. Uh, they usually leave it to me to come up with, to conceive of the general framework of the, of the thing which I'm good at doing. I know how to make uh, framework you know, of songs and so mm -hmm. on and records. Uh, I learned from Phil Spector how to conceive of a framework of a song, to think in terms of production rather than just songwriting, which I was unable to, I was unable to really think as a producer un up until the time I really got in familiar with Phil Spector's work. Then I, I started to see the, the point of the whole game. The point of the game was you're making records. You're in, you're in the business to create a record. So you, you design the experience to be a record. Mm -hmm. rather than just a song. It's good to take a good song and work with it, but it's that record that counts. It's that record that people listen to. It's the overall sound. It's what they're going to hear and experience in two and a half minutes that counts. True or false, I heard this story a long time ago. They said that when the Beach Boys get finished at a recording session, they always want to hear the playback over a little uh, kind of four-inch speaker to see what it was going to sound like in car radios yeah. coming out of AM radio stations. Yeah, this is uh, in order to get a realistic a view of how it sounds. You did do that then. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people, you know, the studio monitors are these enormous, you know, no one can ever hear a record oh, yeah. at home well, like what it sounds like in a studio. And you used to really have a little speaker just to hear what it would sound like in a car. But we'd blast it on the loudspeakers and, and, and feel the bass in the gut and feel the, and really get your ears knocked off with all the highs and the fr high frequencies. But when it comes down to listening to what it's going to sound like over a small speaker, we get, we get right down to just playing it right over the little speaker and hearing it at a realistic level, which uh, we're uh, used to knowing... Uh, levels you know mm -hmm. we know about levels and things so we know what just about what it's going to sound like on a speaker on a car radio and so on like that so it's it helps to do that because then you know where you're at i know what a fan you are phil Spector, and how much you admire his right. work as a producer uh, first of all do you think there the, who who else in, in in record producing bob you? crew i think uh Terry, now, bob you know, crew did a lot of frankie avalon's records didn't he no frankie no? valley oh, frankie valley right right uh bob crew is another model producer who i admire i admire his his knack for being able to make a commercial record, his knowledge of commerciality. Uh, Terry Melcher, who's not as well known, but is, uh, Terry Melcher is probably one of the greatest examples of, of, of a good pro producer, just a producer. Uh, Van Dyke Parks is another music mm -hmm. man that I think is, is, is just amazing. And who co-produced some things of the Beach Boys with you. Yes, you? Uh -huh. he, he got involved with me quite heavily and uh, steered me in some good directions and turned on some light. Especially in the Surf's Up album. Right. Was, was Van Dyke involved in Pet Sounds as well? No. That that's, was just you. I met him right after Pet Sounds. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about some of the way um, records are being produced of late, in the, here in the middle 70s? Uh, what do you think of um, the... I mean, there's really a, almost a new production technique. Every record is sounding very, very... To me, anyway, when I say every record, I mean a lot of records. Uh, very, very kind of clean, slick sound, and a lot of what I thought was the old kind of rock and roll funk seems to be gone. Do you think it's, it's going in a good direction? 
They're becoming very antiseptic. Is what no, I'm it's not to say. going in a good direction. I don't think it's going into any, any by any means in a real good direction. I think uh, it's become very stale. I, I think, of course, we're enjoying it though. Mm -hmm. I don't see how we can enjoy all this stale music. But uh, <laughs> as I say, I got involved in making stale music, and I think, uh, which is another word for commercial like music. You know, it's music that's just there as background, as uh, as uh, sort of like a little. Uh, pocket symphony in your head, you hear these little symphonies, and you hear a two-minute symphony and it's gone. You're on to the next thing. Uh, consciousness. Re as a matter of fact, records are, 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 are very strangely connected to the span of man's attention co span, consciousness. It's, it's just around two and a half minutes. It's just, about what, it's just about the level of our concentration. We don't really concentrate too much more than that uh, as far as being able to concentrate on something. We don't, our mind concentration level span does not last too much longer than two minutes so it's it's just about symbolizes our attention span records it kind of has a lot to do with uh, consciousness records mm -hmm. too and uh, for this reason we're uh, we're able to get into two and a half minutes of, of garbage even you know so we get into the garbage it's fine get into two and a half minutes of garbage it's still there you know or get into two and a half minutes of pure art you know it all depends on who's making the music and who's doing what you know so I don't know I think that uh, uh, in some in some respects, R and B still carries on in a, uh, in its regular fashion. Uh, we've seen the Renaissance days for sure. I mean, for sure, we've had our Renaissance. If there's such a thing as a Renaissance, rock and roll Renaissance, it all started in the early '60s and, of course, wound up sometime in the '60s, maybe the late '60s, mid '60s. For four or five years there, we were involved in a quite a Renaissance of uh, popular music, and uh, after that, we. Country Western became more popular. Your rhythm and blues began to become be, began to take over uh, your top 40, and uh, it's still that way now. Uh, your top 40 structure is still so ver so very much diversified. It's hard to to make a study of it. I don't think there's any real true study of music today, because music is so very diversified. I mean, it's simple enough to say there's jazz and there's country, but when you get down to pop music, you're talking about you're talking about a vast situation there. You're talking about something that's just endless. You know? You've been talking a lot about, about old music, and recently I think you were quoted, I read somewhere where you said you have a new attitude about old songs. Old songs, you either said, uh, are the best or, or where it's at or whatever. Well, uh, I think that. I think that uh, your old songs, which live on forever, are as good as your new songs. A song is a song. Now, if it's written in 1950 or 1970, you know, a good song's a good song. A good lyric, a good melody, and a good chord pattern is a good song. And uh, a lot of people have told me, well, everybody's looking for that original song. They want to hear the new stuff from you. And uh, to some degree, I would eat that up, but I can't buy that all the way. I think that it was good. We did Blueberry Hill and Palisades Park and A Casual Look and so on on 15 Big Ones. And I think that uh, it's good to explore all songs. I think you're making a mistake to cut off material just because it was, wasn't written in 1976. Uh, it's, it's, it's also very good to show your ori original side. Now, a good blending, I'd say 80-20 might, might, might be about right. 80% original, 20% old, if there's to be some percentage involved. Now, when you did 15 big ones, you had, I mean, tons of songs right. to dig at. How did you narrow, the, I'm talking about the oldies now, there are f five on the album, six? How, how, what others did you consider, and how did you narrow it down to... Palisades Park and Blueberry Hill. Well, we actually we didn't really have that many to choose from. We we went in with the notion that we. I said, Carl, I want you to cut Palisades Park. Last night I took a walk in the dark. I sang it like that to him, and he got the and he, and he took off on it. He got the feeling. You know, I just said I want it rat, I want it funky. I want you to take off and and really be funky on it. So he really tore it up. I Was mean, Palisades he, Park just kind of an, an old favorite of yours? Oh, I cried. I, when I heard him, when I heard his lead, he, as a matter of fact, he did the lead without me there. He did it at the studio when I wasn't there. And uh, he, he brought the tape over and I heard the tape and I cried because he uh, impressed me so on the way he, he did the lead. I just, I was so impressed that he knew where that song was at. He, he interpreted it perfectly, just the way I wanted it to be done. And I, j it just took me to do one line for him to get a feeling. And he took off and he did it. This is how it was on Blueberry Hill with Michael. I just went, I found my thrill. I just wanted it to be simple, and uh, Michael interpreted it and did it. I must tell you, very good news. We did You've Lost That Love and Feeling, oh. and, uh, which, of course, is a Phil Spector uh, masterpiece. It's, it's one of Phil's truly great records. It's one of his truly meaningful love songs. It's a love song that has a lot of meaning to it, and it, uh, 
and it's temperate for the times. It's, it's, it's a very timely song, and it's an example of Phil's sociological genius. We, uh, we did You Lost That Love Feel. We did uh, uh, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, which I don't think we're going to use. We did uh, On the Bank of the River, Running Bear. You know, oh, running, yeah, right. So, you know, all these different songs we did, and uh, we're, uh, we're not going to use them all. You know, we can't. There's only so much space, and, you know, mm -hmm. and the better ones win, and the, and the lesser ones don't win. You know, that's the way it goes. How democratic is a Beach Boys recording oh, session? All the way. We're, we're a democracy. We've, uh, we're, we were conceived that way. Uh, we, uh, we vote. We have a voting system. Uh, as a matter of fact, we voted on oldies but goodies on 15 big ones. Dennis was very much against having oldies, and we hit, took a vote, and in in, in, in it won. Oldies but goodies were to be represented in 15 big ones. One man, one vote? Oh, yes. Michael, Al, and I was three, out of three to two. Dennis and Carl voted against. Michael, Al, and I voted for. So this is how it works. We... Uh, Fortunately, I didn't have to have a vote on the title, Brian Loves You. Uh, fortunately, I went to each guy individually, and they all just flipped. They said, yeah, that, that rings a bell. They, they can't see. Why not say Brian Loves You? Why not? Jesus Loves You, Brian? You know, same thing. No difference. You <laughs> That's know, great. It's, 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 it's the same concept. It's, it's, uh, it's a spiritual idea. By the way, shortly after this conversation was recorded, the Beach Boys decided to change the title from Brian Loves You to The Beach Boys Love You. We go in with the idea that we're going to do such and such, and we do it. We'll do a few extra, and then we'll take the vote on what goes where. But as, by and large, we're really pretty much down to schedule on songs. We schedule, all right, this week we're going to do this and this, okay, then, and we go in there knowing it's going to be good. We never go in there knowing it's not going to be good. We know no matter what we do, something good's going to happen. Because everything we touch turns to gold, practically. I mean, that's, as soon as you get the notion that when you touch something, it turns to gold, usually it does. It'll turn to gold. It'll, something will shine through. You know, it's, it's a funny thing, but... Uh, to take it back to the beginning again, this, this question I've always wondered about, and it has to do with the early surfing records by the Beach Boys. Surfing was really, uh, in America anyway, a Southern California phenomenon. Yet records about surfing were embraced everywhere in the country. I mean, what did they right. know about surfing in Ohio Nothing. or in Pennsylvania? What, why, why did that turn so many people on? Do you have any idea about uh, that? I think, I think it turned people on because it was a mystique. Uh, it's like the snow to California. I think it's the same thing. I mean, uh, a snow fad would have taken over in California. I mean, very, suppose New York would have come out with a snow thing where we're riding in our toboggan or something, toboggan riding in the snow. It's the same thing. Surfing was, uh, was unaccessible to uh, people in the East, well, in, in most of the country, an unaccessible sport, something you couldn't do. So uh, there was a mystique to it. It was something from California. There's the thing in California. Same thing with the snow. It was snow songs would have made it big in California had it, had it would have mm -hmm. taken off. Same difference, <coughs> same difference. It's, that it's, feeling of freedom. And surfing really represents, and I'm not a surfer, I know nothing right. about it, but in my mind there's a certain... I feel the same way about hang gliding or free falling on out of airplanes. Just kind of a freedom and a flow to it. There was also a sociological aspect of surfing. Where there was a lingo that you, you that there was a way of talking. There was the bleached blonde hair, the Hirachi sandals, uh, uh, jeans, cut off jeans, sweatshirts. There was a certain look to a surfer. A certain golden blonde hair, the bleached hair. There was a way that they walked with the hands behind the back, folded their hands behind. You know, there was a certain way, the way they danced the surfer stomp. There was a whole lingo and a whole culture involved in surfing, which some of that mystique caught on nationally too. It wasn't just the fi fact that people went surfing. Mm -hmm. There was an attitude about surfing. It was an outdoor attitude. It was a very funky it was a form of funk. If we could just take a, a couple of minutes, Brian, and talk about, on a, on a maybe a more delicate level, if you wouldn't mind, discussing the kind, of, uh, I, uh, the kind of pressures that led up to you kind of cooling it for a while, or uh, I guess getting ill in a sense. Uh, was it just uh, what you talked about earlier, this sudden change in your life? Uh, I'd reached a stale point. I'd created my head off. I'd made a lot of records, wrote, written a lot of songs, and sang my, my face off. You know, so I was blue in the face, and uh, I reached this point, the point of exhaustion, overall exhaustion through the years, a certain uh, cycle of exhaustion, not a daily or a monthly cycle, but a yearly cycle of exhaustion. And uh, not to mention that I was using a lot of different kinds of drugs that were draining me. And I was becoming paranoid through the use of drugs and uh, the combination of all these things. My father dying had a lot to do with my retreating too, which I don't mention to many people. Uh, these reasons, for these reasons, I did retreat and uh, became ill. And uh, for a, a couple of years, I was fairly inactive. I wasn't really active at all. I wasn't writing. I wasn't producing. I wasn't really doing anything. 
And uh, up until the time that a psychiatrist took over my life and put me on a program of uh, disciplines, a series of disciplines, uh, at that time I began to uh, uh, start to live again. I start to become alive, you know. I started to come back into life a little bit. And uh, thank God I'm into a schedule now, and I think that I've got the feel for life. I have a feel for things, you know. It's, it's more uh, tangible. Ideas are more tangible now. I have something to relate to. I can get up saying, I do this and this today. I'm happy about the album, getting stronger every day, keep my mind, you know, suggesting things, you know. I took up uh, hypnosis, self-hypnosis, about two months ago through Pat Collins, who's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's does the TV, yeah. Very person. famous lady uh, on the strip, Hollywood strip. She, she conducts uh, shows that where she commercializes hypnosis and she hypnotizes people and has them do things and she proves the power of hypnosis to people and uh, because of this a lot of people enroll in her courses I enrolled myself took three three classes then had a personal consultation with her and she uh, suggested many things to my mind and turned me on and, and of course showed me how to hypnotize myself and planted planted the suggestion that self-hypnosis would become very easy to me which it has and I'm using it now for a number of things in my life and uh, I can't say enough about what hypnosis can do for a person using self-hypnosis to learn the technique somewhere it uh, untold pro untold things happen it's un it's a great thing you know th this uh, program <clears throat> is on all over the country and there are millions of people listening and in, in any group of millions of people there are probably some people listening who are feeling at a place in their life maybe a little desperate or a little pressured uh, or down and maybe you know we can take a use a minute here to let them know that there's another side through every tunnel oh yeah I mean <clears throat> when you get into mind ruts like uh, you get into places where you think you're trapped can't move to the right or the left because there's uh, this and that happening and this person says this and you have this influence and that influence in your life uh, a way to break the barrier is through self-hypnosis it's it's putting the subconscious mind to work any relationship between hypnosis and transcendental meditation? Uh, no is real relationship. Is the state relationship. at all? I mean, is the, the state, state at is all? A like there are similar states in that it's a subtle state of relaxation. Your body becomes more relaxed and limp. You uh, take on uh, the qualities of just before you go to sleep, that feeling of uh, relaxation just a few, maybe a half hour to a 15 minutes before you're asleep. You're in a state, what they call uh, suggestibility state. Alpha state. Alpha state. This is right. the brainwave state is, is not working as hard. And you're uh, in a passive state of mind. And uh, in meditation, your mind becomes passive. And in hypnosis, it becomes passive. So there is a, a similarity. Uh, I personally combine the two together. I meditate while under hypnosis. So I do it at the same time.